confidentiality of the of the situation is uh, sorry Susan we, we, we okay look in there can you hear me can you hear me yes we can Susan okay so confidentiality and speaking out are always <laughs> or maybe not can you hear me yeah. Okay. Confidentiality and speaking out are in some ways, you know, dichotomies. Because when you're speaking out, you're making it known that you're you are aware of what the mm -hmm. issue is. There is so, you know, um, but there is an obligation to keep these matters confidential. They're not supposed to be the you know, a point of gossip. Um, again, we're trying to make people aware that obviously these type of things should not be gossiped about. There are there are obligations and uh, upon entities to keep this stuff confidential as well. Um, and so, you know, the confidentiality depends on all of us who are aware of a situation, not to make it. A, the matter of public gossip. That's the main one of the main points about this. These things are are for people who deal with these on a day to day basis, confidentiality is part of what we do. So, you know, it is it is something we talk about issues only uh, if they are already public knowledge. And for somebody like me in the area of, of discipline, that means, for example, that it's before the dispute tribunal, or you know, it's it's been a subject of a judgment actually, because that is something that is public. Up until then, I do not talk about things other than in a very anonymized, general way, and that's true of others who work in this area. Um, but you know, obviously, people will be aware of it, and and they are obliged to keep it confidential, but. Uh, you know, people will gossip, and we're trying to bring about awareness of the negative aspects of gossip within the within a workplace. I hope that answers at least some of your questions. Thank you. I won't ask another follow-on question from that. Um, I'll hand it over to Gabe now. If if Gabe is working. I think, I think we're, we may have lost Gabe yeah, as well, so yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead. We're, we're, we're having uh, technical difficulties all around. Uh, I suppose this is the, the one of the downfalls of having a global workforce, uh, but we'll persevere. Um, so Christina, if you don't mind, I'll ask you the next question. Um, uh, as, a, as, as a HR chief in Manesco in Kinshasa, uh, working in DRC, a country where same-sex relationships are criminalized, uh, sorry, it's not criminalized, um, is legal, but we know there's not social acceptance, if we can put it like that, of, of LGBTI people. Um, and there are often high reports of violence against uh, LGBTI persons in the community and in cultural settings and social settings. How difficult then in, in your situation is it to implement the policies and procedures that have been set up by, by Susan and Bill? So what I'm really asking for you is, even when we have strong policies, when we're working in the field, um, are these policies implementable? Good. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I would like to clarify. I'm not the head of HR. Uh, HR is one of the sections that I have under my supervision. I'm overseeing. I'm the chief operations resource management, so it's a broad, uh, you know, uh, funnel of, of, of sections and units that I have. But HR is one of the important ones that I have. So before going into your questions, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me uh, today. It's, it's, for me, it's a great honor to be here. And I have to say that uh, when the head of Globe, Monusco, uh, suggested uh, me to be part of this panel, I was a, bit, a little bit surprised because uh, would I, a straight woman, 
uh, be the right person to talk about uh, these issues, in fact, so important. And afterwards, after the initial discussions, uh, I realized that, yes, I do the, the perspectives and uh, to contribute uh, as the official, as I said before, overseeing a resource management in the field mission. And I can talk maybe uh, not only about MONUSCO, but many of the field missions, because I realized that I'm the only field uh, representative here. Uh, I have the knowledge. That, 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 would be, that would be great, actually. Yes, I can see that. So I can bring maybe some of my knowledge and uh, specific challenges uh, that uh, the LGBT uh, plus individuals, both on a personal and administrative level, are facing. As a professional, uh, increasing uh, institutional support for diversity, including LGBT plus individuals, has been an important part of my career, I have to say. And also, uh, as a woman who has worked in very rough male-dominated peacekeeping environments, I have personal knowledge and experience on how hard it can be, and I have witnessed and experienced discrimination and uh, and LGBT uh, status. So going back to your question, I want to say that in DRC, it's a country where the sex, uh, the same sex intimacy is not criminalized, it is legal. So um, I applaud uh, all the the inputs from uh, Miguel and, and Susan. So this policy is about uh, expected conduct by the UN employees that uh, we all hope, especially with the, what you say about the, um, the policy framework and the toolkit. We all hope that this uh, will be, you know, uh, we will have the compliance from all the UN uh, staff soon. So very honestly, however, in the field, uh, there is a broad-based sense of uh, among many of these uh, types of anti-discrimination policies won't actually work. So, and it is some more potential uh, violators and potential victims. Even if the policies were more widely applied, uh, I and we all uh, think that there needs to be broader work to change hearts and minds. Disciplinary regulations really do this, and it is much too easy and uh, to hide animals under bland language that does not fall off. I see uh, when I talk about we, because it's not only myself working on this, we have many uh, staff that they are uh, engaged in, in supporting the LGBT uh, plus people. So I think that the type of cultural change I refer to here is only seems to happen in peacekeeping mission. And if senior leadership uh, personally makes issues a uh, priority, as MONUSCO has done with gender, for example, senior leadership will uh, particularly responsive if policies are adopted by relevant New York departments. And if reporting is required in case of peacekeeping uh, by DPO and DOS, for example. So here in MONUSCO, we are ready to support and uh, to assist. And uh, I don't know, I will stop here. And if you have more questions, I will be happy to, to answer. Well, I, I thought what you said about changing hearts and minds was, was very interesting. Um, I'd be interested to just briefly hear what you think are the key challenges to this. Um, for example, like having worked in, in the field for many years, um, how do you, encourage people to attend non-mandatory trainings, which often uh, equality, gender, LGBTI issues are. Uh, and, and trainings don't often make a point of Well, I think there's also a cultural factor. We need to, I mean, to we need to work a lot on this. We need to work not only with HR, we need to work with the welfare, staff counseling, not only, I mean, in the sense of staff counseling, but we need to engage more on the welfare side. Here in the, in the mission, we, we engage in having some uh, night uh, movies. We have posters uh, around. We have um, the... Uh, as I said, the head of GLOBE, he's uh, quite active. So, but 
we still have this stigma, we still have these cultural difficulties to, to, to cross. Also, we need to understand that this is a, a peacekeeping mission. So we have a lot of troops and maybe we can also help if we can have a pre-deployment training that can include this kind of training before coming. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, next, also, we're going to speak. If I may ask, so if sure, I may ask, sure. maybe to make a campaign attractive to use uh, innovation, basic information on what it is, in fact, LGBT, what the persons are, but basic information that, as I said, due to the cultural background or maybe where the missions are deployed, not everybody is aware of. Thank you. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I, I, I ran the, the um, LGBTI training that our own Jen, I think, um, has created with IOM and UNHCR in, in Kenya and Syria. And I actually found it was very well received when we were discussing things like language and cultural context. So if you really adapt and, and work with staff, I think even staff we would think uh, wouldn't be it can be very surprising if you if you're willing to engage. I think management are a little bit afraid of the backlash from their own staff and from the government. So it, that that can be sometimes the barrier that we face in trying to make those changes. And I think that leads really well onto um, our next panelist, um, which is Kimani. Um, Kimani is is a former UN Global Coordinator in Nairobi, and he's also a national staff member um, in the UN offices in Nairobi. Kimani, do we we have you online? And with sound. Uh, let me see. Can you hear me now? We do. Yes, we can hear you very well, Kimani. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, Kamani. And um, given we've had um, our, our experts speak before you on, you know, policies, procedures, trainings, um, and how to change culturally the, the different UN uh, entities um, around the globe, I'd be very interested to hear about your experience um, as a national staff member of, of homophobia um, in, in the workforce. Um, and whether you felt in your position, whether you could speak out and you could you could actually um, engage with the authorities on these issues. Okay, uh, so speaking from uh, the context of where I come uh, from a country where being uh, gay, being lesbian, even being uh, bisexual is, is, is illegal, um, I would say I've grown up with homophobia all along my life. And um, my first experience uh, of homophobia was especially, like it was in, was in high school where it was very tough. So it kind of grew into my, into my skin. And coming into the United Nations, I, I did not expect anything less. So, and that's the reality for most of LGBTIQ plus people in my country, and especially national staff uh, coming into, into their workplaces. So we live two lives, a life where you uh, present to your colleagues that uh, you are any other ordinary staff member, uh, probably married to conceal your sexual um, identity or your gender identity um and 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 that's how we sort of try to survive uh but the case for me was was different because everywhere i've gone i've always um been a starter in terms of of coming out whether sometimes it's by choice and sometimes it's uh, it's accidental and it so happened for me the first case was accidental at the united nations when uh i opened up to uh, a few of my colleagues and they couldn't keep that information confidential so it ended up uh in 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 many people's ears um so what followed after is that um people started labeling me as as a converter I could not 
freely socialize with uh, fellow workmates or with uh, people who uh, worked alongside me. And one specific incident is that I was talking to uh, a very good friend of mine. He's still a very good friend of mine right now. And uh, we were spotted talking and we were having a very good discussion and laughing. And soon after, one lady approached uh, my colleague after departed and um, he was warned that I should keep he, sh he should keep away from me because ideally I was going to I was going to combat him and this came from another UN staff member um so it was very hurting uh and 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 it's happening it it's happening across across uh across the, the ladder everywhere this is this is what's happening and it's the reality and uh, again, I could say in 2017, where we had the first panel discussion on LGBTIQ plus issues at the United Nations office in Nairobi, we put up an ad uh, requesting or asking people to come to, to this meeting. And two days later, it was pulled down. And this is because staff members actually wrote to um, the people in charge of managing the bulletin board, and they say this is against um, the laws of the land or the laws of the country. Uh, and clearly, the laws of the country speak about uh, the the act itself. They do not speak about you uh, expressing yourself, expressing your views. And and the ad was pulled down, and it had to take the intervention of the director general then to put the ad back up. And, and and that's how the, the meeting continued. Again, we requested for the pride flag to be displayed back in 2018 when we were celebrating Ida Hobby for the first time in Nairobi. And we know that other duty stations uh, have had done that. We provided proof that they had displayed the pride flag. Uh, but the kind of communication we got is that uh, the UN does not allow the display of any flags that have not uh, that are not member states. Um, but you could clearly see the undertone there is that people are not comfortable that uh, there is this group of LGBTQ plus people who are trying to speak up, but people will hide behind the same policies, behind the same rules to justify transphobia, homophobia, and biphobia. And these are the things that we should look at. Are the rules actually that we are making being used to justify these types of phobias across across the United Nations? Um, again, there's always the narrative, uh, even as we are collaborating with senior leaders, where they say, do not put it out too much into their faces. Um, it's always assumed that the LGBTIQ plus agenda, in quotes, is, is something that is a taboo and especially in Nairobi. So you always still do not put it out in their faces. Uh, like you, you, you have to, yes, we accept you. Yes, the policy uh, accepts you. Yes, on paper, we are okay with you being LGBTQ+, but when it comes to actually uh, standing out as that indiv individual who's LGBTQ+, you're not allowed to really, really be yourself because you're not supposed to put it out there and in, 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 on their faces because for one reason or the other, it will, and I would paraphrase this, it may backfire. Uh, so uh, these are some of the few examples. I mean, I could go on and on and on where I've also had people talk behind my back and say that uh, I'm being paid to be gay in the United Nations. So there are all kinds of interesting and at times very, very uh, discouraging comments uh, when it comes to biphobia, transphobia, and homophobia at the United Nations. Can I, in, in light of the kind of stark reality that you present to us um, today of your, of your lived experience as a UN staff member, I wonder that we have a lot of people on the line here today um, who are national staff in countries similar to yourself. I wonder if you could share with them maybe a, a um, maybe a, some sort of an encouragement in in terms of uh, of of living in in the situation and living openly and out in the workplace like you do, um, because I think 
it is very difficult uh, for people in your situation, and we have a, we have a lot of staff in a similar situation. Um, so I wonder if you might might speak a few words to that also. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. So um, what I would say, coming out is a personal choice. Nobody is uh, is really obligated or forced to come out. You know, it all depends on. Uh, how comfortable we, you are with, with, with your own, uh, who you are, because we also have internalized homophobia. And that's uh, maybe due to culture, maybe due to religious views. And everybody is on a different path in terms of coming out, in terms of uh, discovering yourself on that, on that spectrum. Um, but what I would say to anybody right now who's LGBTQ+, plus, the first thing that you can ever do and the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to love yourself as who you are, you know. Uh, do not wait for the world to love you. If you wait for the world to love you, 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 will, you will get hurt. Uh, I, personally, I waited for the world to love me and for the world to accept me, but that's not what I got from the world. So what I learned is to how, first of all, learn myself, accept myself, and, 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 and come to terms with who you are. Like, go through that journey of self-discovery, you know? Uh, for me, it was an amazing time when I realized, or what I could have said, when I finally came to a point where I felt like the shackles had been set, had, had been set free, because for the longest time, I lived in a world where I thought uh, being gay, was wrong, you know, and I, I, I would hide, I would constantly hide, and I would uh, uh, pretend not to be gay. Um, but for one or the other reasons, people are in different situations. That, was, that is what I'm trying to say. But the most important thing that you can do is to love yourself and accept yourself. And if you need, uh, there, there are networks out there. There are people that you can reach out to and, and talk to, and, and they can help you. There are resources. That, that are actually available all across the, the, the board. Uh, you can get resources as easily as going to YouTube, as easily as going to the UN Globe site, you know. Um, uh, there are networks of LGBTIQ plus people within the UN system. And, and, and I'm sure there are tons and tons of resources that can help uh, any staff member, even allies, in terms of uh, knowing how to, I mean, uh, be an ally, be a better ally. It's not just on book, it's not just on paper, but actually practically standing up for LGBTIQ plus rights and issues. Thank you so much for, for sharing this and, and for, for sharing your story and your background as well with us, Kimani. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, I think I'm hoping that we have Gabe um, on the line now to ask the next question. Yep, if I'm here. Oh, you um, do. Okay, excellent. That's right. uh, also, thank you, Kamani. That was that was excellent. Uh, some excellent advice. Um, just for time's sake, I, I need to move on to uh, asking Saranya, Inspector Saranya, a question. Um, uh, as a security guard uh, or inspector, you're also one of the key people to ensure the safety and security of people on the UN premises. Um, so with that in mind, how hard is it in reality to implement uh, the policies or, or something that work among the state? I'm losing you, Gabe. Sorry, Gabe, I think, I think you broke up a little bit there. <laughs> I'll try that again. Um, so uh, as a security guard or inspector, uh, Inspector Saranya, um, you are one of the key people to ensure that the safety and security of us in the uh, in UN premises. So how hard is it in reality to implement the policies that Miguel and Susan that uh, people like myself or Sonia or Kamani are safe while we're at work? Okay, thank you, Kev. Thank you for the question. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Uh, and I hope you're all, all well and safe. And happy belated Idaho, Idaho Day to, to you all. 
and I'm honored and privileged to be here with you today. Now, how hard it is in reality to implement, uh, to implement such policy, it really depends on the location of where you are. You know, it, it has been well covered by, uh, by Christina and uh, Himani. Now, an another challenge is that, you know, security uh, personnel would, would encounter is, you know, manage expectations. You know, we would like, okay, for example, right, SCAP has a very uh, a great initiative in recognizing the uh, LGBT uh, colleagues, right, in the uh, recognize the right of staff members to determine their gender identity and expression. Uh, that that includes, you know, the the respecting uh, people's choice of gender identity, using the names or pronouns in the communication, in uh, but not limited to communication between staff members in email, in memorandum, or you know, in the staff directory. Now. Implementation of this is okay. However, uh, in the uh, context of the official record, uh, for example, you know, we are reproducing ID cards, a qual pass for staff. If your if your passport say that your name is Mr. Smith, that's what the the qual pass will be, right? Even though that, you know, because of your uh, gender identity, you would like to be called uh, Samantha. Okay, so that's one of the challenges. So we, we're going to have to manage expectations you know, from, from the uh, our, our staff member as well. <clears throat> now, is that answer your question? Is it helped? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good example. I've I've experienced that also with um, with changes of name and changes um, that are on official documentation or official emails. Um, to follow up with that, um, and and as you as you talked about to manage expectations, um, what measures or steps do you take? kind of on the other side to make sure that that we in the LGBTQI community um, can feel safe that they can come to you to report a safety incident. Okay. Another challenge, you know, back to the, uh, related to the first question, right? Another challenge is that, you know, we, we're going to have is encouraging people to come out and report security incidents, you know, especially in this case. Right, that you know, it's sensitive, and uh, people may not feel comfortable coming out. So, uh, at SCAP, you know, for, for you know, for us as security personnel, we treat everybody equal anyway. We treat them with respect. We treat them with uh, dignity, regardless of their gender. And you know, we strive to build an environment where all you and personnel feel safe to come to us and report security incidents. And as I said earlier, you know, we, we are trained and are committed to assist our clients, regardless of their gender, background, or status. Now, following the implementation of the gender policy, gender inclusiveness and enabling an environment guidelines, and in support of this initiative in recognizing the rights of transgender staff members, with encouragement and strong support of my chief, Triple uh, S Bank Park Training Unit has continuously conducted gender related training for our security personnel. We have been engaged uh, you know, in conducting the women security awareness training for UN personnel as well. So, two years in a row, uh, gen uh, we have conducted uh, gender related training to emphasize gender consideration as important in you know, addition to security management framework. Which is applied onto the entire security management system, the UNSMS. The goal of the initiative is to establish an inclusive and enabling organizational culture, culture free from gender bias and discrimination. To be more specific, in uh, 2018, the training was, was designed to raise awareness among security personnel, taking into consideration women's perspective, security threats, issues, and concerns that men men and or 
and women may be exposed to different physical or psychological hazard and risk. It was considered that you know the exposure to the same risk may impact women and men differently when operating in the field. You know, be it the culture, the residential or security, uh, hotel security, uh, exposed to sexual harassment or assault, domestic violence, uh, the use of public transportation, taxi or vehicle breakdown. Now, the uh, particular attention was given to how Triple S personnel responded to complaints, grievances, and requests from clients while maintaining a gender sensitive approach. With this training, we have a total of 71 security officers attend. Uh, it's a one day training and we have organized four sessions. In 2019, a one day training was conducted in co coordination and co facilitated by a UN, uh, UN group coordinator, Matthew Cody. He co facilitated this training with me as well. So, this training was, uh, was organized to enable security officers to respond with increased awareness, sensitivity, and effectiveness while conducting their daily duties. The session was aimed to enhance an inclusive and enabling organizational culture and strengthening the, gen the gender inclusive environment through the use of gender inclusive communication style. And this training, you know, we combined the two supplemental training, supplement supplementing training that organized by uh, our regional ombudsman, Ms. Susan John, the, uh, who is conducted a community civility communication. And this whole session, uh, his whole training was attended by 82 security, uh, security personnel, you know, just for this session. And we also organized four sessions, you know, for them. And, you know, Matthew, uh, being a co facilitator, the training has been very helpful because he has been, you know, sharing the insight, uh, expectation, and, you know, the, the uh, challenges experienced or, or, you know, difficulty that experienced by, uh, by the uh, LGBT community. Is that help answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, um, it, I know that we have a lot of, of great representation. I'm looking to get. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Now I can. Okay, I'm looking to get. We've lo we've lost Gabe. I'm uh, I'm afraid. So thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, do you want me to come in for the next question? Yes, please. I know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, for Sonia, and all the amazing work you're doing in ASCAP. Very mindful of the time. We've got 20 minutes left uh, before. I just want to, if you know, some of the panelists, if they're okay to stay on, maybe 10, 15 minutes more, uh, if that's okay. Uh, just you know, um, uh, if that's not okay, put your hand up. That's not okay. Put your hand up if you're okay to stay. Thank you very much and thank you again for dedicating your time. Really appreciate it. So now I'm going to quickly go over to Roberto. Uh, Roberto, uh, you're, you're here today as a member of, uh, or you're representing the UN uh, Staff Council of Geneva, and, uh, which is a part of CISOA. Um, and we have a UN Globe has a MOU uh, with CISOA. Um, now, my question to you is, as a member of the Staff Council, one of the key functions is to promote uh, discrimination, uh, promote non-discrimination, sorry, even, to, uh, to promote um, non-discrimination, uphold the principles of uh, um, equality. How, um, how do you make sure that the voice of staff or, or the voice of staff and in the design of those policies when you're negotiating uh, with uh, management, you know, what role do you play in uh, promoting that and, and, and encouraging speaking out uh, against homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia in the UN system? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nano. Uh, thank you to invite me. Uh, good morning and good evening to everybody. So, first of all, I would like to highlight that the 
the UN Energy Staff Council is a staff-owned representative body that is completely separate from any administrative control, so we are completely independent. It is a, its aim is to negotiate with management a favorable solution for staff members. All staff members are represented by the union and may approach the union uh, with grievance or complaints against the supervisor or the administration and may be represented if desired by someone from the staff council in, a, in the following of any um, uh, grievance procedure that they may intend. In this specific, I am a staff representative, I am also a gay staff, and I am serving as a focal point for homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia related issue, abuse and discrimination. In consultation with my colleagues in the UN Staff Council and only with the authorization from the staff member, we can intervene personally in their favor. We have two kinds of solutions. The first solution, we have an informal approach with the management to find an agreement to support the staff member and protect their rights. In some cases, we can step up and we can intervene for legal solution in collaboration with two different entities that are OSLA and Obusman. Um, against the management, if necessary, or even the human resources. There are um, a lot of cases of discrimination and harassment, uh, in particular for homophobia, biphobia, transphobia across the UN system. And I would like to say to all my colleagues that I'm here to hear your voice and ensure the necessary support that you may need. You may know that we have a memorandum of understanding with the Coordination Committee of International Staff Union and Association of the UN and the Federation of International Civil Servant Association, but also with uh, UN Globe, as you may know. With the UN Globe, our first, uh, um, how we can say, uh, activity for the moment is uh, information sharing so UN Globe can also flag some cases to directly to me uh, or to the uh, UN Staff Council in, uh, in order to intervene and to support the staff member. I hope that this collaboration will improve in the next years in new way of collaboration. Um, over to you, Nano, if you have some other question. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta, and thank you for keeping it very concise and packaged, especially when we've got very limited time. So, you know, we're from UN Globe's perspective, so I turn on my camera. From UN Globe's perspective, I think we're very happy to have this memorandum of understanding with uh, CISOA as well as with FIXA. And one of the other remaining federations we have to reach out to is UNICEF, which represents um, national level staff. So that's our next. Uh, hurdle. So thank you very much for the work we're doing and we're looking forward to collaborating with you all. Um, look, uh, we're halfway through the first round of questions and also looking at the time as well. So quickly want to apologize for the technical issues that we've been experiencing. Uh, we have got over 200 uh, people online. So yes, there are going to be some issues. You're very interested. Thank you for keeping uh, sending your questions in. You can send them in directly to the host, to me. Please keep it relevant to the topic um, of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, um, discrimination and harassment in the workplace. Uh, we will not be addressing any questions when it comes to mobility or to recognition of gender identity. I'm afraid that will be for another topic. Uh, today we are speaking about speaking out against violence and uh, harassment in the workplace. So if your questions are to those issues, Please, uh, we will be answering, hopefully trying to answer those at the end. Just as a wrap up, um, before I go on to the next round, I just wanted to mention to you that uh, UN Globe advocates for the equality and non-discrimination of all LGBTI staff in the UN system and its peacekeeping operations. Uh, UN Globe board members and coordinators, we are all volunteers and we have no official UN funding. So therefore, we rely on your contributions and, and donations. So please, if you see the uh, PayPal, if you can see the screen, uh, you can uh, snapshot the QR code and please do think about sending a donation to UN Globe. So uh, 
Again, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. So I'm going to hand it back to my amazing um, moderators who are doing the best they can in given the technical difficulties. Thank you. Over to you, team. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the next question to Christina, if you don't, uh, if you don't mind um, coming back back on to us again. Um, one of the things we often hear from from our colleagues working in the field is about moving to duty stations in which um, either the laws are there to criminalize LGBT people or there is a cultural or social um, you know, uh, situation where it's very difficult um, to live openly as an LGBTI person. What do you think uh, you can do or, uh, to ensure that um, LGBTI people feel safe enough to apply for such um, positions? And I'm in particularly interested to, on, on your opinion about maybe what HR colleagues could do um, to ensure people are applying and then also to ensure uh, a safer workplace. Thank you very much for your question, indeed. Um, I wish I could say that there are no concerns uh, for uh, LGBT plus people in DRC and especially in MONUSCO. Honestly, uh, I can't, though there is a widespread social discrimination and uh, I have and we have witnessed uh, this inside and outside the mission. But at the same time, many of our, of our colleagues uh, from LGBT uh, have fulfilling personal life, lives uh, and professional lives in, uh, in MONUSCO uh, and uh, especially in, in the DRC. And uh, I can say that DRC is uh, far from being the worst place uh, to work. And uh, um, at, I can say that at the basic level, I believe there are still some uh, significant legal and administrative uh, issues that we need to solve. And to take uh, two examples, for example, it is always uh, challenging to arrange for LGBT spouses to enter. Uh, when the government does not recognize the same-sex marriage. And uh, in MONUSCO, we face the peculiar situation when uh, our r, &R uh, destination criminalizes the same-sex activity, whereas our mission area does not. So we would like more flexibility and advice in addressing such challenges from uh, UNHQ. I also believe that, as I said before, the key issue is to win hearts and minds rather than uh, going directly to the discipline side. So on uh, these measures focus on changing this need to start with directions from New York and the adoption by the highest level in the mission here. Uh, as I said before, uh, MONUSCO leadership has approved by a variety of events and uh, it was quite uh, successful. We have, as I expressed before, this film night, posters, screen campaigns to promote the LGBT acceptance. And uh, our human resources section also would like to work with New York to include more diversity, positive messages in standard employment uh, forms, like, for example, in Inspira, if possible. And also to brainstorm uh, on other innovative uh, programs with LGBT uh, IQ plus persons questions can be answered in an appropriate and confidential manner. Also, as I expressed before in my previous intervention, I think that we need to increase the awareness in a way to respect our multicultural diversity uh, from our colleagues. And to have, uh, we talk about uh, training, but I think that we need to do it in an, a more innovative ma uh, manner. When we talk about training, people immediately get bored and they don't want to go and they don't want to do it. And when we talk about mandatory training, it's less, less attractive. So I think we need to, to brainstorm a little bit more, especially in the field emissions, when uh, we're just like forced to do it. And when, as, as I said before, we have these different uh, components and this diversity of force, police and civilian staff, we need to be all together. We need to work together. And when I said about let's get together with the, the unions, the welfare, and our colleagues. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Christina. I, I think you made some very interesting points there, and I, it's issues that come up uh, again and again. You know, um, I think HR issues are are uh, outside of direct discrimination are are really the issues that come up an awful lot. You know, can I trust my HR person to share information? Um, am I safe to to provide them with with you know my marriage certificate? Um, and then even colleagues, many of whom are married or in a civil partnership, um, are sometimes afraid to you know make a declaration. Um, their partners come in on on 90 day visas or they come in sometimes with the, the assistance of of uh, HR as a, a not as a spouse, but as a brother or a housekeeper or a nanny or something like this. And I think people find this quite derogatory and demeaning to their relationships. But I suppose this is a situation where HR are, are trying to adapt and trying to help um, in, in countries where there really isn't a lot of maneuverability. But what, what we have seen in some countries is that sometimes the, the agencies or sometimes the, the head of mission are are really not willing to make any sorts of efforts to 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 kind of facilitate this. And for for example, you know, with some of the agencies, we see uh, a certain agency is able to get a visa for for a LGBT spouse, but another agency says they can't, maybe because they don't have that relationship. So really, I think there's a, a really a vast um, area in terms of HR um, and administration and hiring that that really needs to be engaged with. And I really thought. Uh, your points about needing further guidance from New York was very interesting as well. So it would be interesting to hear what Miguel has to say next. Uh, th uh, th th thank you so much, uh, Sonia. And uh, yes, I fully agree that, you know, there's, there's a lot of responsibility that New York has being the policy setting uh, office and uh, working with all the several stakeholders and, uh, and, and you know, in a variety of issues. I mean, today we've been focusing more on speaking out, but as, you, as other colleagues have said, there are many administrative issues that, that, that are very challenging and particularly, you know, in, 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 and they are different from one jurisdiction to the other. And we are cognizant, we're very much aware that particularly in, 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 in a lot of the field locations, uh, uh, th there are, there are bigger challenges you know addressing some of some of those aspects and ensuring that that everyone has you know is treated with dignity and has the same rights as as a UN employee or a UN personnel so uh, a, a lot just to agree in terms of things, <laughs> you know in, in terms of leadership i think that's paramount uh, uh, for all the managers and all the senior leaders to demonstrate knowledge to demonstrate uh, 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 um, leadership in addressing issues of ensuring that the workplace is is a dignifying workplace for all that they bring issues you know relating to misconduct and they take those very very seriously and uh, and again creating a positive welcoming conducive environment for all so i think you know leaders uh, uh, we all have a responsibility of course as staff members and individuals both in our workplace and in our personal spheres but certainly, I would put the emphasis on our leadership, and uh, and uh, and you can rest assured that OHR will continue to work with uh, all the stakeholders to ensure there is knowledge sharing, there is training, there is advocacy, and uh, and the policies, procedures of the organization, as I said, go and uh, are founded in the right principles and go in the right direction. What I also say is, you know, it's, it's, it would be important, and I want to thank all the colleagues, you know, that have talked about their personal experiences, because I think that, you know, visibility does help shape or change hearts and minds. So, for example, as a director, you know, HR, when I put a picture of my husband and daughter in my office, that speaks and that sets the example as well. And, uh, and so I think that all of us uh, uh, in the community who are able to speak out, you know, with, with different volumes and, and in different ways, that's, that's, that's also a, a step forward. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Sunny. And thank you so much, Miguel. I think you make a, 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 two really good points um, about dignity in the workplace for all. And I think that really links in with something Christina said earlier on. Um, 
where often you find that if LGBTI people are treated well, women are also treated well, and people of different minorities are treated well. And sometimes I think uh, when we do these trainings, they, everything helps each other, right? We're not working in a silo. We need to work together um, and deal with these in a multifaceted fashion. Um, and then also, I think um, your, your point about visibility being um, important, I think is really core. If we have this power, if we have the privilege to be able to be out in the workplace, I think it's really important to do so, especially for our colleagues who are not able to do so. Um, and so I, I really, I'm, I'm in a similar situation to you. I, I try and be as out as I can in the workplace, even when I'm working in the field, if it's safe for me to do, do so. Um, because really, by just speaking with uh, LGBTI people, um, working with them in a day in, day out, um, it can really change hearts and minds, as, 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 as uh, Christina mentioned also earlier on. So I think these are they really tie in very well uh, with each other, and I think they also tie in very well with my question to Susan. Um, if we have Susan still online, yes, yes, okay, me? Susan. Yes, I can, Susan. Thank you. So Susan, based on what we just discussed there, um, I, I was wondering if. Um, if to see if these policies and procedures are effective and are working, do you think we need to conduct the harassment survey again in the Secretariat in the future? Um, and do you think the Secretariat needs to do, do better based on what you've heard today? Uh, thank you, Sonia, and thank you again. And uh, sorry about the problems earlier. Um, I found it very interesting uh, to hear people's experiences and, uh, and from the field especially. Um, so I thank you very much for letting me participate in this this webinar webinar. Um, on the survey that recently we did conduct uh, the the staff engagement survey that had uh, ten or so questions dealing with harassment issues. Um, so that uh, happened I think in November of 2019, maybe a bit later, um, and those. Uh, each each uh, department has has already received its um, outcome as well as I think it was posted on uh, I think the, the the secretariat wide uh, results. Um, so hope, I hope people have had a chance to look at that. the The sexual harassment survey that was undertaken under the CED framework back in I guess 2018 was. Um, was somewhat useful, although a lot of people did not feel comfortable answering, whereas many more people seem to be comfortable answering in the context of at least the Secretariat's uh, uh, own survey. So I would encourage each entity, insofar as they do so, uh, to, to do entity-based uh, surveys. Um, and we we are uh, beginning part of the 2019-8 requires uh, um, information to be collected on interventions as well as informal interventions as well as formal interventions. So, you know, it's still early days, but eventually there will be more information again on an anonymized basis on how many issues are being dealt with by um, entities in the secretariat. Uh, I would say it would be two or three years before such information may be available. Um, but in the meantime, you know, anecdotal information does get fed through. Uh, and, you know, again, we, we encourage people uh, to speak up, just as you said and, and Miguel said. Um, and just to, again, reiterate uh, that you know the the new policy did really work uh, to include gender issues. Um, discrimination was uh, was uh, expanded to include you know discrimination on sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, um, and it made clear that harassment included any harassing behavior on the basement on the basis of such shared characteristics. So again, we encourage people to be aware of these issues 
Um, and if the, insofar as the survey helps, you know, that's good. Um, but as I said, people should look at the outcome of the harassment questions in the recent survey that did take place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Nani, where are you on the line? Yeah, now? okay. Um, back online. Uh, sorry, dealing with some issues behind the scenes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, um, we have a few questions if our panelists will. We won't be able to get to all of them, so thank you for sending everything in. Um, the um, uh, so some of the questions that we've had are, you know, we're going to stick to the ones that are pertinent to this topic as well. So we won't get get to all of them. Some comments have come in to express thanks for this. Um, there was one question in particular, you know, um, if I just go to it very, very quickly. Is there any form on an acknowledged LGBTI community within UN for the staff to speak up? Yes. Uh, there's UN Globe, in fact. Uh, so we are the community, <laughs> community of the UN. So uh, reach out to us. You can become members. Go to www.unglobe.org. Join us. Uh, and it's not just for LGBTI community. It's for allies, too. You want to help us speak out against homophobia, biphobia, transphobia in the UN. So we're inclusive of all. Um, so you, you're welcome to join. So there is a formal um, uh, group there. For those um, who are interested in finding out if there's a coordinator in your duty station, you can go onto our website and go into our people. And there's a list of uh, coordinators there uh, per duty station. I don't think we have one for that country per se. I think there's a question for um, for Indonesia. Um, a comment came in from UNICEF to share, say, um, I think going back to what Roberto said, uh, UNICEF's Global Staff Association sent out a message of support of Ida Hobbit and circulated the UN Globe statement in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, I think in other duty stations they translated it to uh, our statement into Italian and Portuguese. Um, so yes, there are many ways that our staff unions are getting involved. So I think um, if I go down and zoom into this topic in hand, um, the first question is. Um, to Miguel and perhaps to Susan and maybe Christina is, what would it be good to have a, a, these as mandatory training for all staff personnel in all entities like security and briefings? And then perhaps more specifically to Miguel and to Susan, you know, what is the UN doing at a global level to have a policy on diversity and inclusion? And if there is one, you know, how is it being implemented? Um, just as an aside as well, um, Marta Helena was due to join us, um, sadly is not able to because of technical issues um, and has to run to another meeting. So we were hoping to have her between meetings. Um, it has been very difficult with uh, the technical issues today. So thank you for being patient with us, uh, especially on doing something at this global uh, scale. And thanks to our panelists for also being patient with us. So, um, but with those two questions, I hand over to Susan and to Miguel. Susan, you want to go first? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Would you like to go first? Uh, okay. Um, on the trainings uh, right now, uh, there is already a mandatory online training, um, and it is uh, and it's very good. It was updated about two years ago. Um, they're updating it again now for the 2019 eight issues, um, and uh, and uh, it will you know the the change for example in the definition of harassment and discrimination will be highlighted for example. On the, there are trainings that are mandatory that, um, that are being developed with learning. They're called UN, uh, United, United to Respect Dialogues. They are, they, at least I've participated and I hope some others may have participated. I, I did a mini one in um, Minusco when I was over there and I don't think I saw Christina there. But in any case, um, uh, they're excellent. Uh, training modules that are being developed, materials that, um, and we're undertaking train the trainers. So, um, insofar as UN Globe members are interested uh, in joining in on that, they, 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 there are uh, uh, 
make yourself known basically to uh, the OHR, not to me. Dominique Gagnon, we can give the name, is, a, is one of the people who might, who is uh, the, the chief of learning. Those trainings are, will, it's mandatory to offer them in each entity on a periodic basis. They're face-to-face, -face, and I do think face-to-face -face trainings are very important uh, to, to get people aware and more comfortable with these type of issues. So please look out for those trainings um, if they're held in your duty station. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Miguel. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Nanu. Just, just to compliment, to, to say that uh, we, we're looking at mandatory training and seeing, you know, not only not only on the issues of diversity and inclusion and non-discrimination, et cetera, but uh, uh, as to, you know, really in terms of the philosophy and how, how it can really be implemented and that it means mandatory that that is is really taken very seriously by our staff but so more to come on that but as, as susan said i think the important thing whether through training or through other means uh, the, there are a wealth of resources the united respect is one for example but uh, the un Globe also has a wealth of resources and others that staff can and managers should be looking at educating themselves and and really uh, uh, being advocates for 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 uh, ensuring there is non-discrimination uh, in, in in the workplace. I think in terms of the policy, and, and I do hear you know Nanu's, Nanu's uh, provocative suggestion that we have a diversity and, and inclusion uh, policy. I think a lot of those bits are in you know in, in in different in different parts of different policies, including you know the SDSC SGB that Susan has has very ably spoken about. Uh, um, but you know we we are continuing to make and 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 uh, very deliberate efforts to 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 project and show to the world that the united nations is uh, is 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 creates the conditions for a conducive non discriminatory you know embracing and and an environment as i said earlier it's just this year we started including you know uh, related language in the job opening so that as an employer it's really a statement of uh, of uh, of, uh, of our responsibility that we take very seriously as an employer of speaking out you know ensuring that we we we, we look for people from all all all, all, all backgrounds and and you know and from the, the widest uh, spectrum of diversity as possible uh, we're going to also to make uh, in line with that some uh, some improvements to the the careers portal, which is sort of the crown jewel in terms of interfacing, uh, insofar as jobs with the outside world. You know, again on the same topic and on with the same emphasis, so that so that we so that so so that everyone who wants to work for the organization is very clear that we take this very seriously as part of the way that we work. So I'll leave it here. Thanks, Nano. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, we have received a couple of more questions, and I'm going to quickly go over to Susan, perhaps more on this. There, um, and before I do that, there was one comment in how UN Globe or how this is being involved in, uh, engaged in what is known as the Interagency Security Management Network. It's a network of all the security officers or heads of security from each agency. And the, within the interagency um, inter security management network is a gender working group. And the gender working group came together last year, or, or finalized at the beginning of last year, a guideline on as gender inclusive training or gender inclusive policies. And throughout, when well, UN Globe was invited to be a part of that working group, and we made sure that LGBTI issues were mainstreamed throughout that training manual. So to that person who asked that question, yes, we are working with the ISMN. Um, just two more questions, um, perhaps more to Christina, perhaps for something from the field level, and maybe to Roberto. Uh, what cap mechanism should colleagues use for speaking out, maybe at the field level or uh, through the, uh, the staff union? Um, that's to Christina and Roberto. And then one question I would like to maybe to Susan. How do you train investigators who can think in the shoe of 
the survivor. Um, I'm not going to use the word victim, going to be, uh, but use the word in the survivor of, of, of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can start, uh, or maybe Christina, maybe she wants to follow. One of the tools is uh, obviously the um, staff union, because we can help the staff member to build a case and then uh, um, conduct a, a direct negotiation with the manager or help also to build a case with OSLA or Obensman. So as I am a focal point today, you can contact me directly to my email. That is quite easy. It's just my um, family name, Colangelo at UN.org. Uh, and then I will uh, um, deal in um, confidentiality directly with the staff member and advice in collaboration with my colleagues in the staff union and support you in case uh, we need to build a case against the manager. Over. Thank you. Christina, that question is yours. Okay, um, I can speak from the field side and the perspective is totally different because it's uh, quite sensitive, especially here in Monusco. So I think that the staff member, they need to assess who is the more, uh, let's, get, let's say, sympathetic ear in the field because they can go to HR, but HR cannot uh, feel that they can feel the... the or maybe fulfill the needs of the staff, or maybe the staff that they can uh, receive this uh, staff that they need to be supported is not the right person. The same for the staff counselors. We have, of course, the, the head of GLOBE here, that it's, it's always supportive, but not everybody wants to go to him, not to be identified. And it's the same, that's why I'm here. Normally people come to me, they thought that I was part of the LGTB community because I'm not married. So uh, people tend to, to go wherever they feel more comfortable. And uh, for example, in my case, I am uh, I'm very open to listen to and to guide them where to go. And uh, I think that that is also a niche that we need to explore. How can we guide them and how can we assist them? And how maybe we, how to create uh, a way to I don't know if it is through the staff counseling that they don't feel uh, comfortable because they say, I'm not sick to go there. So this is something that we need to explore also, how can we assist them? But I mean, in, in this environment that I am in now, it's uh, the person that they feel comfortable. Could be, as I said, the supervisor, a friend, and then we guide them. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I want to um, push that over to Sarania. Sarania is a security officer. How do you deal with uh, making sure that, you know, that if someone comes to you uh, with a harassment case, or how do you deal with it? Or, you know, what are the, what are, what are, what are the mechanisms for you as a security officer? Okay, I, uh, thank you, Nanu, for, for, uh, for the questions. So, I think for the uh, being security officer, like I said earlier, right, we, we treat everybody equally. However, with the, you know, first we have to build trust, and we have to, uh, you know, build the uh, safe space. And how do we do? How do we uh, build the safe space? So we're trying to get, you know, officer to be uh, gender inclusive in the res you know, in in responding to the questions. You know, show sympathy. You know, uh, explore the. Uh, uh, respect the uh, confidentiality. And you know we have we have this uh, guideline, the principle for uh, addressing the uh, security incident. Right, first is you know safe, providing the safe environment, confidentiality and consent, and uh, you know we we deal with the the staff member that comes to us with respect, and of course you know you know without with with the non discriminatory method. Uh, manner. So and with that, you know, we hope that we will be able to assure the staff that they can feel safe, you know, and come to us and, you know, talk to us. You know, the, the training that I have conducted uh, in the last two years have been 
have uh, uh, received a good feedback that the security officer is more gender sensitive, you know, and then they use the gender uh, inclusive language that, you know, does, does not identify uh, gender or, you know, one gender or from the other. So, and, you know, we, hope we continue to develop those skills and, uh, you know, the trust from the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saranya. I'm glad to see that the training is working and it's going better. Um, Susan, the question was for regarding investigators. How are you training them and sensitizing investigators on this issue and making sure that it's um, that they have a pro-victim approach in terms of um, or sensitizing a survivor approach that they you know listen to the survivor of, of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia? Uh, thank you very much. Um, just to uh, add on the issue of support, is um, one of the big changes, and this leads into the answer on the investigators, is that the target or the affected individual or the survivor is, um, is, is allowed to have a support person with them from the very outset. So the, the whole issue of support is very much to the forefront of the revised policy. Um, and it, it, it should be a staff member, but it could also be a non-staff member. If, if it's uh, certainly for emotional support, it can be a non-staff member. Uh, for, for being involved in a formal process, it, uh, the support person can actually be part of, uh, of the interview of the um, complainant or the affected individual. Um, it, it, the, it is required to be a staff member, but if reasonably acceptable to the panel or the investigators, it can be a non-staff member. Um, so that's one issue. That, so investigation is not, uh, it's a neutral undertaking. They are, uh, investigators in the UN are very aware of respect for diversity issues and um, and those issues, but but really what their their role is is to find out what happened, not uh, and to listen, obviously, but uh, but you know the the there will be hard questions asked, but not about. Uh, past history, et cetera. It's about what happened in relation to the event in question. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a friendly undertaking, but, uh, but it is one where we, are, we have tried to ensure that the um, survivor is given support throughout the process. Uh, and what they get by participating in the process is a neutral fact finding that that seeks to ensure that their their issue is heard and fully canvassed. Um, so that's what uh, the the goal is for our policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you for in, you know making highlighting how you train them all and uh, train investigators and work with them and how they uh, go through the process of collecting data. Now, before I wrap up and before I hand over uh, to Miguel for some closing words on behalf of Marta Elena, Gabe, Sonia, do you have any other questions that you may want to, or I'm opening to you to, is there anything else to add? Are we good? Nothing for me. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. All right. And just from me, thank you so much for all of the panelists today and, and for all of the people who sent in questions. I think if we haven't um, asked them today, um, there's a series of issues that people have raised that I think us at UN Globe um, are very glad to see and, and we can follow up from our, our own side on those also. So thank you so much. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, uh, before, uh, so. Oh, and just to follow up on, on Sadia's remark, um, if you send in a question that we didn't get to answer, um, we may not have your contact info through the WebEx, so don't hesitate to send us 
the same question or, or more information uh, through uh, our email, uh, which is uh, you could do OHRM uh, underscore globe at un.org or unglobe at unglobe.org. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gabe. Thank you. Uh, so, Miguel, um, I know that Marta Elena couldn't join us today because of an urgent meeting that uh, Marta Elena was called into. And sadly, uh, they, uh, Marta Elena did try to join us, uh, but uh, for, again, some technical issues. Uh, so, I want to thank you for stepping in. And um, if you would like to say some closing words before, you have, uh, before I flip the sign off. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. And, and yes, uh, Martelena was trying to get in, and she was uh, and, and join us, but unfortunately, it was not possible. So, on her behalf, I just want to thank you and everyone at the UN Globe for organizing this panel discussion and encouraging everyone to break the silence on the issue of har harassment in the UN system. As you know, the Secretary General has made it very clear that the protection of LGBTI personnel is one of our top priorities. And I want to stress once again that the organization has a zero tolerance approach to discrimination or harassment. We know from the space survey that, that LGBT staff are one of the most vulnerable groups to sexual harassment and that we still need to do a lot of work to fight biases and eliminate homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia in the organization. And this discussion panel is a great example of how we must keep raising the issue and highlight the experiences of our LGBT workforce across the Secretariat, as well as the UN system. While some progress has been made in the past years, we need to continue to have an open conversation on how we can ensure that LGBT staff are better protected. As I said also in, 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 in earlier on, the COVID-19 crisis has put extra, extra stress on all of us, and many colleagues are struggling in different ways in this situation. And we know that the crisis has hit those who are already vulnerable, uh, vulnerable, especially hard. So I'm pleased to have learned about the support that UN Globe has been offering to its members during the crisis. And I also want to express my gratitude and my thank you to all of you. I also want to reassure you that uh, the well-being of our personnel is our main concern. And, uh, and uh, in OHR, we remain committed to protecting the rights of LGBT personnel and promoting a workplace free, free from any discrimination, uh, not just you know, at, and, and during this important day, but, but always. Um, UN Globe is doing invaluable work in this regard. So I want to thank, you know, personally thank Nano, Gabe, Sonia, and uh, all the colleagues that have participated in the panel. And again, I wish you all uh, Related Happy International Day against homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. And I look forward to continuing to work with the UN Globe to advance this important agenda. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Miguel. And indeed, we do look forward to, I personally look forward to working with you as well as with the board in advancing some of the topics and the issues that we discussed here today. Um, on behalf of UN Globe, uh, let me start by thanking uh, Gabe and Sonia, or myself personally thanking Gabe and Sonia for the excellent moderation in the difficult uh, and technical challenges that we face today. Um, thank you very much for the, the, their support. I also would like to thank the amazing panelists as well for being patient with us while we had, had those challenges as well, but providing us with, with their, their share, sharing their time and providing their uh, knowledge and experience as well, and also their coming forward to agree to work with UN Globe as well. I think the only the it's very, very clear that we need to go further together and to ensure inclusion and diversity and safe and equity as well for all people in the UN system, including LGBTI staff. We need to work together, and UN Globe is happy to partner with you. So, from my side, Miguel, um, Susan, Christina, Kimani, uh, Roberto, Sarania, a big heartfelt thanks for sharing your time today. Um, it's very, very important, and let's keep the conversation going. To those who are still listening, thank you very much uh, and for participating. Nano, I'm, yes. I'm sorry if I may can can I have one minute, just one minute. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just would like to, you know, uh, encourage uh, the colleague, right, to check the DSS website for the uh, travel uh, advisory 
you know, whenever this uh, travel restriction is lifted and we, we, we can start traveling. Because we're, uh, right now, uh, I'd like to share if you don't know already, gender portion, including uh, LGBT you know, community uh, advisory has been uh, formed part of the travel advisory. So wherever you know you, you, the uh, destination that you are going, you can check what is the local you know uh, law or, or restriction in, in the destination you are going. Just would like to share that with you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. I don't know what happened there. Uh, another technical glitch. Um, yes, definitely. Um, we are work at, we are planning to work with UNDSS on providing better. Um, uh, advisory when it comes to traveling and visas etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, some of the agencies are doing that themselves i think at unhcr have started some of that work i believe so yes they're running very very yeah it, it is there now so okay, you know perfect. it met right. yeah all right just just to share thank okay you. thank you um to those who are still with us uh again we're still having technical difficulties you can see when we have a webinar of such I demand it can put a strain on the resources. So thank you very much for being patient with us. Um, on behalf of UN Globe, um, um, I want to say thank you very much for joining us today. If you are not a member or you're, you don't identify with the spectrum as being LGBTI, you're still welcome to join UN Globe. Uh, please do consider joining. Uh, go to ungloeb.org. Uh, like Gabe said, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them. Uh, if you want to continue. Uh, answering, asking questions, uh, I'll be happy to address them. You can send them to me personally, sandu at ilo.org or at unglobe at unglobe.org. Uh, this is being recorded and we hope to have, hopefully, uh, this is being recorded. We hope to share it with our members on the website. Um, the uh, last thing I want to say is um, happy International Day of uh, against homophobia, biphobia and transphobia to all our members. Um, stay safe. Uh, please do consider giving a donation using the QR code at the bottom. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure and um, have a lovely evening. Uh, evening, afternoon, morning. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day and have a good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.